How's it going, everyone? I hope everyone is doing well. This is the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour. Everyone is doing well. I am coming to you uh, live from uh, Dojage, which has long been a meeting spot of various First Nations, otherwise uh, known as Montreal. My name is Eve Engler. This is the uh, Canadian Foreign Policy Hour, and I believe we're up to like number 47 or 48 of these sessions. Uh, so getting towards the uh, one year anniversary. And uh, there is, um, there are uh, uh, many developments in Canadian foreign policy this week to uh, to get to. So I figure I'd jump in right away. Start off with, um, I guess, some good and bad news. Kind of a couple of items that are a bit more uh, positive-y, I think. Um, well, beginning with maybe more on the negative side, but the Canada's trade minister at the uh, the uh, PDA, P, uh, Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada convention in uh, Toronto, the big mining convention, met with the uh, prime minister in the uh, usurper government in uh, Peru that came after the coup three months ago. Uh, and that's just continuing Canada's um, backing for the uh, Dina Boluarte's uh, replacement government of Pedro Castillo. Now, on the more positive side, side uh, it's, uh, it's amazing the mobilizations have continued. Huge protests still continue now, three months in. You wouldn't, of course, know that from the statement that came out from the Canadian uh, uh, minister that there's anything untowards going on in Peru. And of course, there's been more than 60 people killed. But the fact that three months later, there's still demonstrations, I saw some images uh, from, uh, from Lima a couple of days ago, big protests, and there's a new wave of, of, of those protests. So that's, that's pretty cool. In, uh, in New York City, uh, a couple of days ago, there was a protest in front of Canada's consulate. The ha some members of the Haitian community protested against Canada's interference in Haiti. It's uh, it's imperialism. It the fact that uh, there's Canadian naval vessels that were recently deployed, and we've discussed, of course, Canadian imperialism in Haiti uh, numerous times. So it's good there's a protest targeting Canada. It's not every day that there's a protest internationally targeting Canadian diplomatic apparatus for something they're doing in another uh, 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 country. Last week, I mentioned briefly the case of the NDP um, candidate in the upcoming provincial uh, election or by-election in, uh, I think it's Hamilton Centre, where the uh, former leader of the NDP had, had been, um, Ontario NDP had been, uh, had, the, had, the, had the riding, had the seat. I think it's it's usually considered a pretty <clears throat> pretty safe NDP uh, seat, and um, the Israel lobby came at uh, uh, Sarah Jama. I didn't know anything about her. I think when I mentioned last last week that they were coming after her, and and they ramped that up. Uh, there was this really disgusting article in the Toronto Star uh, one or two days ago, basically smearing her, uh, claiming she's anti-Semitic. Uh, there's nothing besides association that's even presented. It's incredible, actually. Uh, basically, she's associated with pro-Palestinian groups who are who are being accused by B'nai B'rith of being uh, of being anti anti-Jewish. Um, they don't. They haven't actually provided any uh, uh, thing she said until late yesterday. The uh, the uh, the website uh, the Twitter. I think I don't know what they called anti. Uh, anti-Semitism something, stop anti-Semitism or something like that, provided a clip, a minute and a half clip of her speaking at a rally in 2021. I should mention that she's, she's black and she's in a wheelchair. Uh, young, pretty young, pretty young uh, woman. And uh, she's in this, she's making, there's, no, there's nothing in this, with this minute and a half speech that comes close to anything that's in any way offensive. If anything, it's a lack of, of, direct uh criticism in my opinion that would if there's anything as offensive to what she said is that's a, li a little too uh, kind of abstract 
uh, kind of um, kind of you know connecting that it's always Muslims and disabled people who are or differently able people who are targeted and from Palestine to Hamilton. To, it's a little, it's in my opinion, a little bit a little bit vague, um, but nothing that they they desperately try to sort of claim something. I'm not exactly even sure what they what they're trying to claim. Now, what's positive about this? This is obviously horrendous smear. It's odious that you know it begins the Toronto Sun began B'nai B'rith whatever expected and that now the Toronto Stars picked it up they don't quote anybody from the Palestinian community or defenders of Palestine uh in the Toronto Star, Toronto Star article um but what I think is the positive is that there's been a whole bunch of of defending of uh of Sarah Jama from people on the left people who are you know posting very aggressive attack response sort of uh, attacks against against the attacks against the smears including today Jagmeet Singh uh tweeted backing her so that that's I think from assuming she wins and I think it's a pretty safe seat if she wins now B'nai B'rith has launched this like odious campaign um but she's you know she's going to be in presumably she's going to have her seat and they will have failed in the narrow bit of the campaign. Obviously, they intimidate the party. They put the party on the back foot. But the fact that the sort of mainstream kind of social democratic left, to a large extent, has rallied behind her and basically did, said F you to, uh, to B'nai B'rith, I think that is actually uh, uh, could turn out to be quite a positive uh, um, uh, development. So that's certainly something to be, uh, to be uh, followed. Um, also on on Halifax, I mentioned that last week there's the uh, school uh, where Palestinian students at a cultural day were were told to uh, take off their kafiyas because uh, it was a it was a symbol of war was what the principal apparently told teachers and went down the the schooling uh, hierarchy and. Um, uh, but uh, but it's been very good pushback, very good. Tons of corporate media, tons of left wing media. Um, uh, looks like it's a real uh, uh, the school has been really put in its place with this anti Palestinian uh, uh, racism, and uh, so that's a, that's another uh, I think uh, uh, a positive uh, development. Now I'm going to show a video. Do you want, you said you don't want Belarus to uh, uh, please the minister. It's not a question of the minister, because the minister is for it, and that's who doesn't want Russian or Belarusian athletes to participate in international Olympics or sporting events. But did you feel the same way after the U.S. invaded Iraq? How about Afghanistan? How about Canadian, how about Canadian troops after we bombed, how about Canadian athletes after we bombed uh, Libya or Afghanistan? Excuse me. Why, why won't you answer the question? It's a really simple question. Minister sent off. It's a really simple question. Why? How about how about Israeli athletes? Yes, sir. Israel has a fifty-year occupation, fifty-year occupation of of Palestinian lands, an apartheid state. How about banning Israeli athletes? Why won't you answer the question? Why why won't you call for banning? So that was uh, that was Minister uh, Pascal Saint Ange, who's Canada's uh, a sports minister, and she's also got some economic ministerial uh, portfolio today. Um, uh, True, Justin Trudeau was was uh, speaking at the Palais des Congrès here in Montreal and was un unable to uh, figure out to get there on time early in the morning. And then he actually spoke somewhere a second time trying to figure out, but I couldn't get get into this Justin Trudeau thing, but found out about this last minute. 
and I, I don't know if people notice, but the look, her face when when I mentioned, it's like she's happy, sort of, she thinks the question is going to be about banning Russian or Belarusian uh, athletes. But when I ask about Iraq, the look on her face of this sort of like mix of smugness and how like how crazy are you? Um, I thought was quite uh, was quite uh, uh, good. And I was also very happy with my uh, elevator, my elevator work there. I, I, uh, I <laughs> hit the elevator button. So the elevator door opened back up, but back up. So I was able to, uh, to prolong it for a couple seconds, a uh, couple seconds more. But she was, uh, she was quite, quite, um, I guess, adamant that she wasn't going to, uh, to answer that. Now, um, the, the there have been a number of developments on the question of uh, of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the war there, and um, uh, uh, first of all, the uh, Anita Anan, Canada's defense minister, on Thursday announced the purchase of anti tank, anti aircraft, and anti drone weapons, fast tracked for Canadian forces in Latvia and in Eastern Europe. Uh, using the same measures that they the last time they used that was for the war in Afghanistan. So they're basically they're they're you know we got to get more of these weapons to our forces right on Russia's border. Certainly, kind of hinting at the possibility that that they're going to be in uh, in combat. She made that announcement. Just a little bit of a sidetrack here. She made that announcement at the Conference of Defense Associations Institute. Which is an interesting. I, I go into that uh, in a page or two in my a propaganda system book, how Canada's government, corporations, media, and academia sell war and exploitation, which just looks at came foreign policy through the you know the propaganda apparatus that's upholding this unjust uh, foreign policy. Um, but uh, uh, the Conference of Defense Associations, like a century, it's only 1932. It's been around for like 90 years. And it's it was basically the, the Department of National Defense brought together these different military associations and um, and brought them together. They fund it. They uh, they've been it's kind of funding's very changed in different ways over the years. Um, but it has like the the Naval Association of Canada, the Canadian Infantry Association, Royal Canadian Legion, Military Intelligence Association. So I guess these are all just like small little um, associations for different elements of the military. And it gets brought together under this Conference of Defense Associations. Now they have this Conference of Defense Associations Institute has this annual uh, a conference in Ottawa. Uh, usually it's two day over the year. Usually the defense minister speaks, former defense ministers, uh, the governor general is, is I think, the officially the, the head of the Conference of Defense Associations. So it's really this, this getting together of a bunch of militarist associations. And, and it's regular, it's usual that there's some big announcement that the defense minister makes at their, at their convention. And it's just one little one part of this militarist propaganda apparatus in the country. It's often former um, you know, Lockheed, our former head of Lockheed Martin Canada was the head of the Conference of Defense Associations for a number of years. So it really brings together the nexus of, of the military, the arms companies, and the sort of intellectual uh, milieu, the, you know, the, the militarist propagandists, if you want to call it that, in academia and different think tanks. Um, and uh, so it's a fairly influential um, uh, body in 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 canadian uh military uh promotion anyways uh anand made the announcement at that uh convention uh the next day minister jolie said that canada is um uh, uh referred to regime change in, in discussing these new sanctions on russian oil and or russian um aluminum and steel Jolie said the objective is regime change in Moscow and then was asked and repeated, definitely the objective is regime change. So now they're openly talking about, about, um, about regime change. Presumably it's not an error. There has been no clarification of that. Uh, so that's, um, 
that's a step up in terms of the escalatory kind of uh, rhetorical uh, uh, level. And of course, they're able to do this because there's so little opposition, right? There's so little opposition on this question. And we had a little bit of a breakthrough in recent weeks within the Green Party, some sign of, of a bit of a breakthrough. Elizabeth May made some comments a, a while ago, and then and then the, her co-leader, uh, Jonathan uh, Pedo, also uh, on the CBC basically said they oppose the arms uh, donations, the 2.26 billion plus in Canadian arms donations to, uh, to Ukraine over the past year, that they basically oppose that. And he, as, along with Elizabeth May, basically, um, he put out a, basically a, an apology <laughs> for having made this huge transgression of saying that that we this is a party that has nonviolence in its constitution. It's explicit in its constitution. It's a party of nonviolence. And yet it's basically uh, the co-leader is saying now that um, that negotiate and even in this long kind of apology statement, re re reversal of his position on Ukraine, he he uh, he says that basically supports Ukraine getting Crimea back. It's up to Ukraine at any moment. You know, negotiations can't just be a, a Putin propaganda uh, idea. Uh, so even sort of backs away from the idea of even talking about negotiations. It's quite, it's quite, it's quite grim, and and it's basically. Uh, and I should say, alongside this, when the head of the European Union, um, uh, Ursula uh, von der von der Leyen, um, if I pronounced that correctly, um, when she spoke in the House of Commons. Four or five days ago, the uh, Elizabeth May tweeted out that the head of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress was her seatmate, uh, and in her tweet she says this great speech was a very rah rah war speech from the head of the EU. Um, uh, he, she she applauds it. She says Slava Ukraini. Uh, she she talks about her seatmate being the head of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. So she she her, she also is backing away from these sort of hints at the idea of negotiations in, in her reaction to, the, to this uh, House of Commons seat. So now even the Greens are making it pretty clear that they are not, they are not, not dissenting on any, in any marginally significant way on the government's policy. So we have the Conservatives, the Bloc Québécois, the NDP and the Greens, uh, who are all effectively supporting the Liberals' um, uh, Escalating the uh, the NATO uh, NATO proxy war um, with Russia, so it's pretty it's a pretty grim uh, political uh, uh, situation on on that front, um, and it's just a sort of sign of how like wild the climate is. There's this um, uh, master's student who was an intern with Ukrainian Canadian Congress. At the Norman, he's a master's student at Carleton's Norman Patterson School of International Affairs. That also I discussed the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs in the Propaganda System book. It's kind of like the main outlet of like uh, training Global Affairs Canada, uh, uh, you know, future Global Affairs Canada employees. And I go through the the funding for it and all its different connections to Global Affairs Canada, which is you know it, it's kind of a, that's kind of interesting. Um, Anyways, the, this uh, individual publishes this piece in the, the Charlatan, which is the Carlton student paper, attacking the event that myself, uh, Tamara Lawrence, and Miguel, Miguel Figuera did, uh, I guess it's about, uh, I don't know, a month, six weeks ago or so plus in, uh, at Carlton. It was called, the, I think the title was The Path Towards Peace in, in Ukraine. And this guy who who chairs the uh, Carlton Euro Atlantic Partnership Council and headed the model 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 NATO uh, at at uh, Carlton, he publishes this like hard line piece attacking this event where he's absolutely explicit that that the event shouldn't have happened and that OPERG, the the Ontario Public Interest Research Group, the student funded group, gets like four dollars a student. Uh, on campus at, that booked the room. It didn't even sponsor the event. It just booked the room for the for the um, the Ottawa Peace Council, which is you know booked many many rooms over many many years via OPERB on on campus. Um, it this this column just says quote accountability is in order 
and we Carleton students can hold Oberg accountable for exploiting its campus status for malignant purposes. Should Oberg refuse to condemn the speaker's messages and halt sponsorship of future events that trot out Kremlin disinformation as a rational perspective, then defunding must be pursued. This panel should never have taken place on campus. Carleton's deafening silence on the hateful and vilifying rhetoric towards Ukrainian students can be corrected among other, among other recommendations by drafting an official policy on combating disinformation in non-departmental events. If the university wishes to distance, distance itself from being perceived as hospitable to pro-Russian propagandists, it must take action. So this is explicit, the event shouldn't have happened, and if Oprah doesn't you know, apologize for having booked a room, that they should be defunded. So that's the political climate uh, that that reigns on uh, on university campus. And it was this was like a this was the event was set up like four days notice, and it was like twenty or twenty five people that showed up. It's like they've turned it into apparently it's like now caused like you know uh, uh, anti Ukrainian hate actions all across campus and other campuses. Apparently, according to some of the the most outlandish uh, 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 claims uh, floating around. But it's it's really it, you know it's clearly um it's a pretty uh, uh, wild uh, climate on just complete conformity to to um, the uh, NATO uh, proxy war uh, line uh, with regards to uh, Ukraine. The um, the gray zone has a has a good article titled uh, rigorous. Maidan Massacre Exposé Suppressed by Top Academic Journal. And it talks about how Ivan, I can't remember how to pronounce his name, Ivan Kachalowski, uh, who's the um, University of Ottawa prop, he, he participated in the previous uh, session of the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour, that his article detailing how the, the um, the killings, the bulk of the killings during the at the the high point of the Maidan protests in 2014, that in fact it was the anti Yanukovych forces that the, the bullets were coming from the hotel that they controlled, and he you know he he's detailed his tons of video, all kinds of uh, detail. The the trial followed the trial very closely, and now so now the academic journals that agree, had agreed to publish it went through the peer review process, and then somewhere along the way just kiboshed. Um, so the academic journals are bowing to the, the political uh, 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 climate. Now, this, this question, this is one of the great memory holes of Canadian foreign policy, right? The 2014, the fact that the Murray Brewster, the you know, militarist uh, reporter at CBC, who at that point was with the Canadian press, you know, a total Canadian militarist, a senior defense reporter, according to the CBC, uh, at CBC, uh, he he published that story in 2015 that looked at the fact that the Canadian embassy was used as the base of opposition, including by far right forces, which Ivan has has, has shown. Uh, but that the Canadian embassy was used for more than a week as a base for opposition to the elected uh, uh, president, and then that was part you know helped in the whole process of ousting Yanukovych, which then led to fighting in the east. And that's contributed, you know, huge geopolitical impact of that of that event in 2014, and and obviously Canada's embassy being used is is significant. The fact that that was published a year after, and then has just gone down the memory hole. It just doesn't exist. You know, the one year anniversary of the Russian invasion, no one mentions it. It's just that's just historical context that absolutely cannot be mentioned in the dominant media. And, you know, there's even a way you can even frame that as just, oh, Yanukovych was corrupt. Uh, Yanukovych was a Russian stooge, whatever. There's, you know, framings that could sort of legitimate what, what the Canadian embassy did, uh, but they don't even, you know, they, they don't even feel the need for that. They just, just that piece of information is, you know, uh, doesn't exist. And, and if you look at that piece of information alongside the research around who actually killed the protesters that that you know um, uh, put things over the edge to force Yanukovych to to flee. That makes it even more damning, and, and probably 
you know, the, the, the C14, the, the, the far right group that we, that we know uh, use the Canadian embassy, they themselves admitted using the Canadian embassy, who knows what actually went on, right? I mean, then that's a whole investigation about what, what they, what they, how they use the Canadian embassy that, that, you know, deserves to be uh, properly investigated, but clearly no one's uh, going to do that if they can't even mention the Canadian embassy uh, was being used. There's a good article in the Financial Times from um, a very establishment, the European Council on Foreign Relations individuals, titled "Transatlantic Trade Dispute Are Moving to a Disputes Are Moving to a New U.S. Controlled Rhythm." And so, basically, what the story is is talking about talks about the Inflation Reduction Act and the Chips and Science Act, which are recent U.S. policies, which I, I don't I haven't followed very closely. But they have quite significant impacts on the European Union. And this article in the Financial Times is showing that how basically Biden has just totally not just basically sort of screwed over the European Union with both of these acts and just done so without any real consultation. After they push them through, then they say, oh, oh, sorry, we you know, go and listen to European concerns. Don't change anything. And, and he's basically pointing out that as the European Union has focused on the security apparatus and basically as it's followed the US led security umbrella, most specifically or obviously around the uh, war in Ukraine, that that has led to just giving the US even more power over the European Union. And so he, he basically points out how uh, uh, subservient the European Union has become to the US and how the US has really used its strengthened position to pursue these these economic policies that have quite significant impacts on the European Union, and they basically European Union doesn't push back, is not in a position to push back, doesn't really push back, and he's talking about how that's increasingly starting in the context of conflict with China. Um, Americans are framing all of these protectionist policies as you know security related. And so the European Union is not in a position really to, to, uh, uh, to challenge that. So um, I think that it, it confirms the fact that part of what's going on in Ukraine is the U.S. really um, obviously breaking the economic relationship between Germany and Russia, but also uh, really subordinating the U European Union to its economic geopolitical uh, uh, objectives. And, that, and, that, and the story also is linking that even to, to China and how it looks like European Union is, is, is succumbing to U.S. desires around China, even when it hurts them uh, uh, economically. So on the China file, uh, I mean, it's, it, the last week has just been a bevy of more <laughs> increasingly like fanatic uh, stories. Terry Glavin, the National Post, uh, a columnist is just totally, just completely unhinged. Uh, he, he he published one piece that said uh, uh, one way, well, one on the front page of the National Post, I think on Thursday, titled "Beijing could not a, could not abide tough on China O'Toole." And so basically, not only is he saying that like Trudeau is like put in, strongly suggesting that Trudeau was like put in by Beijing. Now he's also saying that it was a coup, that's the word he uses, against Aaron O'Toole, the former leader of the Conservative Party, and it was Beijing that basically sponsored the coup because it's the, the it, was, it was members of the Chinese community, Conservative Party officials in the Chinese community, who didn't like Aaron O'Toole being hostile towards China, uh, that they are the ones responsible for ousting Aaron O'Toole after he failed in the last election. So not they putting the put, Beijing's putting Trudeau in power, and they're also ousting uh, uh, conservative party leaders, according to Terry Glavin. And in, in one of his pieces uh, yesterday, the day before, this is piece. I mean, there's all kinds of just wild stuff in there. But uh, one line he says, "Quote Justin." came into office determined to fulfill Papa's weirdly messianic China dreams. So again, I'm going to repeat this. So Justin Trudeau came into office determined to fulfill Papa, so Pierre Elliott Trudeau, weirdly messianic China dreams. I mean, it's just gotten off into just wild territory where, like, you know, all that Trudeau wants is just to, <laughs> just to, just to you know, 
because when he was two years old, he went on a trip to where he met Chairman Mao with his dad uh, in 1970 or whatever year it was. Um, he's just like, you know, that's been his objective for the last 50 years. He's woken up every morning since then. And he's thought about how can he serve, how can he serve Beijing's, uh, Beijing's interests. So that's kind of more or less where we're at. Uh, Terry Glavin, when I point out how unhinged he is, he, uh, he of course blocked me on, uh, on Twitter. So here's these like tough, these tough columnists who got like the, you know, front page of national post. He's got the whole U S empire at his, at his back. And then you have people on Twitter that, you know, dissent from his craziness and his reaction is to immediately, uh, uh, immediately block them. Um, <clears throat> but it's working. Of course, it's working. Unfortunately, this this it's you know it's not just the National Post. Uh, the CBC had a had a tweet, uh, an article uh, that the, the tweet was, "Parliament Hill is in an uproar over possible Chinese interference in recent Canadian elections, but Beijing is trying to interfere in internal politics of countries on nearly every continent," says one expert on Chinese politics. So it's not just here in Canada, it's everywhere. They're doing it everywhere. Um, you know, they would never have a have a, a, a post like that about the US, even though the US has special forces in like 149 different countries. Um, a one of the liberal MPs, there was a, the headline of one of the articles is quote, Be Beijing is an existential threat. That's a liberal MP saying Beijing is an existential threat. Um, there's a poll showing that 40% of Canadians want the federal government to treat Beijing as a threat, 22% as an enemy, and now it's down to 12% that see China favorably. And back, apparently in 2017, it was 48% of Canadians that saw China favorably. So it's, you know, the, it's, there's many factors that go into it. The pandemic contributed, obviously the, the American just, you know, targeting of China. You know, the front page article in Wall Street, Wall Street Journal a couple of days ago, how the U.S. military isn't prepared to fight the two wars, basically saying we got to we should be ready to fight that war with Russia and got to be ready on 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 to fight over China, uh, with China, China over Taiwan. Um, so it's it's really it is picking up. It's crazy. But this picking up and the, the Chinese have, of course, responded. Uh, President Xi uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, named the U.S. specifically and said, basically, we're on track towards to going to war if this can if the U.S. keeps the the escal escalatory uh, process uh, uh, going. Um, so you know, within that is all the today the front page of the Globe is a is an article top is article is denied entry to U.S. China diverts researchers to Canada. So basically saying that the, the U.S. has clamped down on these Chinese researchers that are, that are uh, accessing uh, research that may have military applications. The U.S. has clamped down, brought in all kinds of draconian policies to end relations between U.S. and Chinese researchers. And so the Chinese are diverting their researchers to Canada for this like covert campaign. And, and this is, you know, if you follow that pattern, which is more or less what has happened, Basically, what you're saying is whenever the U.S. does this, we're going to have to follow with that. We're going to have to follow them because if we don't follow them, they're going to divert, right? Like, you know, the, the Huawei. Um, so we, we're, we're in this pattern wherever the U.S. pursues something, the Canada basically follows suit. And with regards to the, the researcher question, the, the, the Trudeau government bowed uh, about a month ago on that, brought in more. A couple of years ago, they brought in more restrictions and they, they brought in new restrictions on any Chinese scientist that has any connection to the Chinese military, um, that any Canadian scientist can't collaborate in any way with those people and still get access to all the different federal government uh, uh, research uh, dollar programs. So basically making academics, you know, walk away from collaborations. Now, we should say, and I'm doing a piece on this, you know, you can go on the website of Dalhousie University and they announce contracts with the U.S. military. Right. They announce Canadian researchers 
you know, hey, get this money that the U.S. Department of Defense is offering for different research contracts. So we're not just talking about like Canadian scientists collaborating with U.S. scientists that may have some tie to the U.S. military. We're talking about openly advertising, promoting, um, uh, you know, Canadian researchers getting U.S. military contracts. And there's a whole history, you know, they go, I, I talk about it in the, the military book, um, Canadian researchers helping the Americans with, with chemical weapons, biological weapons, there's a whole history there um, that, um, that, that is, you know, taken place that it's, you know, Canada, the Canadian researchers helping with some of the most egregious elements of U.S. Uh, military uh, 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 power. And um, so the, the government announced this foreign registry consultation. They're going to move towards a foreign registry, which, which I don't in, 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 um, in principle have any, any issue with if it's really applied uh, properly. But the, the, there's all kinds of elements to it that are, you know, are sort of interesting. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, whether they will, you know, whether the U.S., Israeli, U.K., Saudi, other countries that also are, are I think, quite clearly uh, interfering in Canada in different ways, whether they, those agents of those countries will be, will be listed. Uh, but um, one of the things in, in this that was a, a little interesting, uh, Melanie Jolie tweeted so there's protests in, in Georgia over this new uh, foreign agents law, uh, and which basically said that if you, I don't know the, all the specifics, but the, the highlight was that if, if a group gets more than 20% of its funding from a foreign government, that they have to register uh, in some way with the, with the uh, Georgian uh, government. And so Melanie Jolie tweeted out, quote, Canada is very concerned by Georgia's proposed foreign agents law which threatens media freedom and civil society and raises serious concerns about the future of democracy in the country. So they're framing that as this is, you know, this is something that, that Russia had imposed uh, to try to control foreign funded NGOs. And now Georgia is doing it following in the footsteps. And this is a terrible thing. It's moving away from the European Union is protests and the government ultimately uh, uh, backed down on it. But it's amazing that Melanie Jolie would would tweet that right as Canada is moving towards something very similar, and uh, um, so you know when it when it can be you know blamed on Russia or when it's uh, about uh, quantifying U.S. government or European Union funding, this NGO funding, then it's a you know danger to democracy. But in our case, of course, it's just a it's just up, upholding a, a democracy. Um, so we'll see where, what happens with the whole foreign uh, registry uh, consultation uh, uh, process. One final uh, comment on, on uh, the China uh, uh, question, which I mentioned last week, and I think I mentioned previously, which is this whole question of division within the, the capitalist class. And there was, that came to light actually during the, uh, the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada conference in Toronto last week. And uh, there was a number of stories. Uh, Robert Freeland, who's one of the, uh, he's dubbed Toxic Bob, because one of his minds back in the 90s uh, uh, polluted in, uh, I'm not sure where in the US, uh, Texas or Arizona, I'm not, somewhere, somewhere thereabouts in the US, terrible damage. And he's, you know, Ivanhoe is big the mining company in, in, in uh, in Mongolia, huge controversies. Uh, in in Congo, I mean, this is this is a Canadian capitalist of the you know of the worst sort. Um, but he he attacked this this business about curtailing Chinese uh, uh, investments in Canadian mines and and uh, Chinese uh, uh, you know collaboration between Canadian mining companies and Chinese companies. So he he criticized it at the at the prospectors prospectors and developers. Developers Association of Canada convention. And also one of the stories pointed out that they had a bare gold. Also, you know, a, a few weeks ago, uh, criticized this whole, what he called deglobalization. And so, you know, this breaking away from China and, and you know, saying you can't have relations with, with, with China or, or trying to lessen the uh, mining companies' relations with China. And, uh, and, and the Canadian minister, um, 
François Philippe Champagne and uh, Wilkinson, I think National Resources Minister, they, 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 they feel the pressure. And so one headline uh, in the business pages was Minister, Rebu Minister rebuffs criticism of anti-China move. Um, and uh, so they're feeling like they, 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 they're talking about how we're not going to go backwards with Chinese companies that are already begun buying some Canadian companies. We're not going to go backwards in, in terms of these security assessments. And one of the companies they blocked, uh, I think, is, 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 is named Lithium Chile. Right. So this is not even it's a Canadian company, like it's you know headquarters here listed here, but it's lithium chili, right? It's it's not our natural resources that Canada's the Canadian government saying that the Chinese companies don't have access to and can't buy out. It's Chilean resources. Um and uh it's I mean it's amazing. It, it you know, the, the, I, I I wrote about this previously about companies in Africa, and there's like I listed all these uh Canadian companies like Uganda Gold or or Congolese mining, they're all, invariably when you find a company that has some like African name to it, invariably it's a Canadian company. Uh, I listed at one point, I did a story on like a dozen of these different companies, like this Chile one's a new, a new example. And it just speaks to the dominance of Canadian mining uh, uh, globally. But, but in this case, the, uh, you know, I'm no friend of the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada conference and certainly of the Head of Bear Gold or Freeland or or uh, these types of people, but in this case, these capitalists they're looking towards just a sort of like you know capitalist trade investment relation kind of relation uh, you know relations with China versus the U.S. Empire military industrial complex um, crowd that wants conflict and um, there's no real good side uh, uh, in this battle. But I think that the the capitalist uh, trade and investment relation crowd is better than the U.S. Empire military industrial complex crowd. Um, so those are that's just the um, the reality of that uh, of the question of Canada's policy towards uh, uh, China. And then just to conclude, uh, I'll be in uh, Hamilton 5:30 at McMaster on Wednesday, speaking about uh, Justin Trudeau's foreign policy. And then on uh, Thursday at 6 p.m. at King's College at, at Western in London, Ontario, I'll be speaking about uh, Canada, Israel. And if you're in, I sent it, I sent the details in the email to the, uh, the weekly send out email. Uh, if you're in either of those cities, please do uh, come out. Or if you know people in those cities, please do uh, share the uh, information and um, uh, go ahead, uh, Hans. I think you have to unmute yourself. I unmuted you, I believe. I think we're there. <laughs> Sorry about the delay. While we're on the subject of China, uh, and I sent you an email earlier today, uh, what significance do you attach to the successful brokerage of a deal between Saudi and Iran uh, and its possible um, ramifications to the uh, Chinese offer to mediate the Russian-Ukrainian dispute. Um, would you comment on that, please? Yeah, I actually meant to mention it. Uh, I got your email, and I agree. It was a good interview on uh, Democracy Now! with um, uh, the guy from uh, Tristan Parsi, I think his name, uh, from the... Uh, he's been... Quincy Institute. On Iran, um, I think it is significant. I mean, I think it's a good thing. I think that you know, ending, uh, restarting diplomatic relations between Saudi Arabia and Iran in and of itself is a good thing. Lessening uh, tensions, it might end up helping out with regards to ending uh, the horrible war in uh, Yemen, and uh, you know, it's in a truce at the at the moment. Um, uh, so that's good. Uh, I think that the fact that it was negotiated in Beijing is good, uh, is also not is precisely what the Americans, you know, when we hear about election interference in Canada, part of what we're really, what, what the real aim of that discussion is we have to contain China so they don't do this type of thing like, uh, uh, 
uh, lead on international di diplomatic uh, 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 fronts like they like they just did. And so, and it seems like the leverage, I mean, the leverage that China has is that it's a big uh, economic partner with both those countries, particularly around uh, purchasing of uh, oil. It doesn't really have much military leverage or, uh, you know, it's not particularly involved militarily with either country. And so that that's, you know, it's obviously better to, you know, I don't like selling oil is not a great thing <laughs> from, a, from a climate perspective. Uh, but but it's uh, better to uh, for these diplomatic agreements to be come about through um, economic leverage or you know rather than sort of military kind of leverage. Um, whether it will it will increase the likelihood of of China being able to negotiate an end to the fighting in in Ukraine? I don't know. I just saw that. Xi is apparently uh, either just had or is going to have a conversation with Zelensky, and then he's going to Moscow. And the framing, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I just saw a thing on, uh, I don't know if it was a headline, a Wall Street Journal article on Twitter. Um, the framing is, is that this is an effort to figure out some form of, um, you know, diplomatic uh, end to the horrors in Ukraine. That would, of course, completely, I mean, Americans are not happy that the, the Chinese uh, would able to oversee this diplomatic uh, detente between Saudi Arabia and Tehran, uh, they, might, they might, might be okay with some of the, you know, uh, lessening tensions in the, in the region. That, that they, they might not have a problem with that. They don't, they don't want Beijing to be the one overseeing that, that's for sure. Um, now, if they were able to succeed in Ukraine, that would really, you know, piss off Washington. Um, but who knows? I, I don't. I don't know. Uh, it definitely hints at the whole, you know, more of a, a multipolar world, which I think is a, is a good thing. Um, and uh, you know, there's some interesting elements. I mean, like you know, there's an element of the sort of left. That would look and you know here you got three countries that are all viewed as repressive and and I think in in different ways probably there's a truth to that you know obviously Saudi Arabia is the most repressive uh, Iran is is also uh, uh, repressive and and China in 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 its own different way um, and, and you know coming to this agreement so there's a segment of the left that would would. Uh, you know, the sort of domestic oriented kind of left that would see this, you know, view this as really like horrible. But I think that the vast majority of the world would see this as, you know, move towards a multipolar world. First of all, a lessening of diplomatic tensions, which in and of itself good, and a move towards a, a multipolar world that is also good. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I think there could be some interesting... Um, uh, sort of discussions in some segments of the left on uh, on understanding uh, geopolitics and empire and and um, whether you can um, label a country as uh, as repressive and even if there's truths within that um, the U.S. empire <laughs> at a macro level is more repressive than um, even even uh, even uh, um, quite oppressive uh, regimes. Anyways, um, uh, I'm seeing. I saw. I saw Laura initially, but I don't see your hand anymore. I see. I see Greg. Uh, so go ahead, Greg. And if Laura, you want to ask, then go ahead after. Oh hi, Eve. Yeah, I'm just uh, wondering. Um, do you see any indications that the uh, NATO alliance is fraying? It seems the politicians continue to beat the same drums of war, and um, they they want to keep stoking this and it seems that i've heard of a wide-scale protests in europe in germany in italy uh, against the nato alliance and now with the uh cy hirsch's exposure of uh american destruction of nord stream one and two um do you see this maybe as a possible turning point where uh germany perhaps may there may be so much unrest that their government could be in serious trouble in the near future. 
I don't know enough about what's going on in Germany, but my, my guess is no. Um, I think this has, uh, this has strengthened NATO. Um, you know, certainly in the Canadian context, which is the context I can speak to most clearly. I mean, uh, Heather McPherson was just the NDP foreign critic was just on effectively a NATO expansion uh, uh, tour in uh, Sweden. I, I'm not sure if she went to Finland uh, and then she went to Ukraine, but effectively on a NATO expansion tour. Um, so, you know, where if if there's always the possibility as they keep ramping up the the proxy war uh, that that, you know, the sort of dissent kind of grows and, and eventually, you know, bubbles over to the point of, you know, a serious uh, challenge to the to the NATO uh, uh, status quo in different, uh, you know, Germany, France, maybe or or other uh, European countries, but that's not that's not what I'm seeing so far. I, I basically I basically buy buy the kind of official discourse out there that this has led to a strengthening of the alliance. It's led to the uh, increased, uh, you know, pushing for hitting the, the 2% GDP NATO uh, military spending target. It's put pressure, you know, different countries to do that. Um, but, but yeah, I think that like, as they, if, you know, as they continue, it, you know, it, it does lead the possibility and, and there have been protests that are fairly significant in, in Germany specifically and other European countries. Um, but, but no, my, my, my sense is that it it is uh, it has strengthened NATO certainly here in Canada, and um, where where that goes I don't really know but but um, you know and and I guess like if 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 Russia is able to uh, you know I don't know, conquer all of the four old blasts that it it has uh, it has said that it's it's that are part of Russia you know if 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 you know, Russia is able to sort of have what's viewed as, I don't want to call it a victory, but I don't think that I think things have not gone very well for Russia. Um, so, the, you know, a, a major victory is, seems very unlikely to, to imagine, I guess, the Ukrainian army could collapse tomorrow and, and they could, you know, take Kiev or whatever, right? But that seems, you know, very hard to, hard to uh, imagine. Um, but anyway, but if Russia sort of, Continues to gain more territory, um, and so you could. And then NATO is put into a position where, do, how far are we willing to escalate? Um, and then if they don't go to that, keep escalating, and you know, send their troops or, or whatever, then it's viewed as sort of a blow to uh, to NATO. Um, I guess that can also have an impact on on um, on how how much support there is for NATO as well. Um, but, uh, at this point I see this as mostly, uh, mostly serving NATO's, um, NATO's interests. Could I just amplify on that? Go ahead. Uh, I followed the, the Berlin, uh, rally, uh, on YouTube. Um, and of course I speak fluent German, uh, the, uh, event on February the 25th, one, one day after the uh, anniversary of the war, drew some 13 to 15,000 people in front of the German Reichstag. And um, it was accompanied by a manifesto for peace. The event was billed uh, insurrection for peace. The most significant demand besides demanding a ceasefire and negotiation was for no more arms shipments by Germany. And the uh, speakers ranged from a former military advisor to Merkel, a general, to a longtime 60s pacifist who was attacking the uh, treacherous role of the Green Party leader, who now is the foreign minister, uh, as well as um, the leading feminist uh, from the 70s, uh, Alice Schwarzer. 
And of course, the initiator and the black sheep of the German left, Sarah Wagenknecht, who um, firmly established the principle of what a left-wing policy should be on this. Uh, the figures that they quoted as to the public sentiment in Germany from a reputable uh, uh, survey institute, Forza, where that some 56% of Germans opposed further arms shipments to the Ukraine. And in the former East German uh, area, including, of course, Berlin, the main beneficiary of Gorbachev's uh, relaxation or the enabling the reunification of Germany, the uh, acceptance of an anti-war position and no further arms shipments was as high as 71%. So I think these are significant cracks and they explain the uh, tawdry behavior of Schultz, the, the, the dallying, uh, and why, uh, why Biden hauled them up on the carpet in Washington last week uh, to pledge uh, whatever it takes to support Ukraine and the American plan. So um, I think that is the first major crack in the unholy alliance conjured up by Biden. And um, I've signed that manifesto. I don't know. Uh, uh, it's got a million signatures in the meantime. So it's, it's making uh, a dent. Of course, it's being totally poo-pooed by anybody and anybody uh, in the establishment, uh, predominantly the establishment media. But I think it's a sign that we should be um, encouraged. And something that obviously uh, we have a long way to go to match. Are there any other uh, comments or or questions? I'm not I'm not seeing any. Oh, I'll just go ahead. Simri, go ahead, Laura. Uh, Simri has his hand up. Oh, you. So, sorry. Uh, okay, how am I going to see this? Let's see. Hmm. Uh, Oh, okay, I see it now. Go ahead, Kim, sorry. Yeah, hi. No, I just wanted to comment. I have to say that uh, whenever anybody invokes the idea of one side or the other uh, winning, I want to cringe. I do cringe because we are living in a time when wars are not what they once were. There's a nostalgia for the old war where we're like World War I and World War II where they sent the soldiers to the front and people were very much affected and it was very up close and personal the war people were dying hand-to-hand -hand combat etc and it was very clear at one time that there would be more casualties on one side and that one side would surrender and that would be the end of the war but now it's an entirely different different situation you have a, a much mismatched power where people are used they have the ability to annihilate the world and to kill us all and it's a one-upmanship game. And the people that are actually making the decision are people that are like, uh, what's her half-wit name? Uh, Madeline, Madeline Albright, uh, who are just saying half a million kids dying are worth it. They're just calculating this like a chess game and deciding. So with those people in charge, with that kind of a situation where they're using these weapons of mass destruction, these, these F-35-like you know, nuclear-capable, uh, it, it can just get to the point where the decision to quit isn't, isn't affecting the people in the ivory towers that have the power to make those decisions. They won't make that decision because they don't have anything to lose from people dying and civilians dying massively in, in the townships and destroying the infrastructure and destroying the ecosystems and blowing up pipelines or anything else. So there's no point in talking about winners and losers or even imagining a scenario in which side A or side B, choose your side, wins. There is no winning. There's only negotiations yeah, yeah, I mean, to end it. I, no, I totally no, agree that there's no winning. I yeah, know, please I totally don't agree, invoke but, that because it, yeah. it can't it can't end with a winner. It won't end with a winner. It can only end with negotiations. And and people don't even understand that most basic, basic fact. 
Go, uh, go ahead, uh, Allison. Can't unmute myself. Can you hear me? We can, yeah. Um, well, what about all the people in Europe who are utterly terrified that Putin is shortly going to overrun Europe as well as uh, bomb them with nuclear bombs. I, I feel kind. I feel kind of mixed feelings about what Hans said. At, at the same time, as I rejoice about, you know, so many people opposing military aid, I think about those people in Europe who are not far away at all and are really worried and and wish that a lot of aid would come to um, stop Putin from advancing and eventually, well, killing them all. Well, I mean, I, I don't, I don't think uh, if they're not uh, just at the level of uh, military um, possibility, if they're not able to uh, take Kiev, they're probably not able to uh, take London. Um, but uh but uh no i mean i i also don't think it it necessarily un it makes much sense with the geopolitical dynamic that's led to this uh horrible uh invasion but um yeah so uh go ahead uh go ahead uh, yuri uh hey eve uh, i'm very sorry, I completely forgot the time today. I thought it was supposed to be my midnight, but it actually was. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I completely missed most of the discussion and what you and, and what you were talking about. But I wanted to know, uh, you know, your thoughts on. Uh, well, actually, I'm curious. You know, I was because I was I was talking with my father today about the whole uh, Russia Ukraine uh, conflict and. Uh, you know, and I, you know, I'm, I'm like most people. I think NATO is completely at fault for it. I think I, you know, they want they they provoked a war. They got they, they got they got the war they wanted. But that said, are you of the opinion that because uh, I know you have, you, you know, you, you have spoken out against the the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and and I know of you know fellow anti imperialists of mine, you know, are very angry when you do condemn Russia's military actions. So that being said, uh, you know, are you of the opinion that, you know, probably a big question to chew on, and we don't have, and we obviously don't have enough time to do it. But are you of the opinion that, that actually no wars are that that there should never be wars that 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 wars that that wars are never justifiable, and that if we want to go back to a world of, if we really want to have like a world of peace and so forth, we should completely do a complete reset on international relations. And that's why you often advocate that, you know, international relations should be first do no harm. Don't meddle in my country. You don't, I won't meddle in your country. Don't, don't, don't meddle in my regional affairs and try to divide and conquer. And there go, there won't be an invasion of your country and all that jazz. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't call myself like a just a um, um, a, a. I don't know if you called it a principled pacifist in in a sense of like a blanket pacifism. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Uh, it's not not something that I've you know spent tons of time thinking about and and reading about. But uh, I that's not my um, philosophy. But um, I've said around Canada, I've said there's only one war Canada's been part of that you could make a case was morally justifiable, which is World War II. And if you actually look at the beforehand and some of the policies pursued, we did all kinds of things that made that uh, conflict uh, more uh, likely to happen. And and uh, but once it once it was going that the you know sending troops was was justifiable um so but you know in terms of uh russia i mean like you know i, I said this i don't you know i believe that in the same geopolitical context that russia faced right which is one of um nato pushing eastward i i do believe that russia is a a uh it's, it views itself 
as a great power and it's a mil militaristic society, right? It's a fairly, it's a militaristic society. And, and um, having said that, if you would have put the people who run Venezuela or Cuba in the leadership positions in Moscow, I don't think they necessarily would have reacted in the same way that Putin reacted. Hmm. I think that, for instance, just one example I've thrown out there, uh, you know, I, why not announce a $10 billion fund or $50 billion fund or some sh insanely large amount of money and say, we are putting aside this fund. We feel threatened by NATO expansion. We feel threatened by, by this, these aggressive policies. We want the Minsk Accords to be, to be fulfilled. And we're putting this fund aside for civil society organizations in Germany, in Poland, in the US, in Canada, to campaign, to pressure their governments to say, Russia is not a threat. We want, we want to go in a different direction, right? Do that. You know, 10 billion, 20 billion, 50 billion, whatever. Like, just, like it's less money than they've spent on, on the fighting, right? So let alone, you know, the people dead and all that kind of stuff, right? So, so, I, so I don't think that, I think that we, there were options, the idea that Russia had no other option, but on February 24th to do what it did, I, that doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, uh, I think Russia is a, does still view itself as a great power. It's a clearly a, a greatly weakened power. Uh, it has, it, it's used to having lots of influence in its region. And you can say, you know, when there's lots of Russian speakers in Eastern Ukraine, there's Russian speakers in Moldova, or there's, you know, they, you can justify, you know, a lot of these things based upon cultural, historical, uh, whatever kind of, um, uh, ties, um, but I think also don't think we need to be uh, kind of, um, uh, I guess I would say you know, naive about about the fact that this is a country that spends way too much of its GDP on the military. It you know has a nationalism that has oppressed uh, many peoples. Uh, it it um, yeah. I'll just say, uh, I'll, well, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll just say very quickly because, uh, you know, business is probably a subject that we should definitely visit, uh, you know, in the future, both on this program and then later on One Plus One. But I'll just, you know, say that, you know, that, that a lot of people would say that Russia uh, had to do what it did to some of its neighbors because of the, you know, far right movements that, uh, that the, uh, you know, European powers were propping up after the uh, Russian uh uh, you know, after the Russian Revolution and whatnot, and 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 if people and if and and and, uh, and you know, for those who don't like Putin, let me just say that the only reason why a Putin even got into power in Russia to begin with was because of after Russia's censure, you know, decade of humiliation after Yeltsin, and Russia was still a you know, we eliminated the left there, and now and and now all, and now all there is in Russia is a Putin, and at least. So that's just, you know, that's just my two cents on that. Uh, Hans, you, you have your hand up? Yeah, yeah. if I may just uh, reply to the uh, threat uh, or the fear of a Russian invasion in Europe, uh, expanding invasion. Um, I think uh, if I may put on my German hat again, the memories of past world wars are much more vivid in Germany and in Europe, uh, the fact that this war has now become a stalemated war a la the First World War, the images of Verdun are, uh, were referred to in this, uh, in this demonstration. Um, this is now clearly uh, a bloodletting, a fratricidal war Sacrificing, sacrificing Ukrainian lives. And that is the first mission that we also must stress. We want to save Ukrainian lives as well as the lives of Russian GIs. Now, as far as those who advocate system change in Moscow, and that, that has been mentioned repeatedly in Washington, 
They're going about it exactly the wrong way. There is nothing that will consolidate Putin's power more than the image of German tanks rolling onto the fatherland. And while the uh, middle class and intelligentsia um, opposition may have been subdued in uh, Moscow, in the big cities, the impression that I have gleaned from watching German documentaries is that the backwaters, uh, the uh, even the, um, the, the the oblast neighboring uh, Ukraine are solidly behind the reclaiming and the defense of the Donbass, and especially the retention of Crimea as a traditionally Russian heartland. So if uh, there are illusions that uh, we are weakening Putin politically. We're going about it the wrong way. One more thing. Uh, I think Ken Stone is among us, and he has an action planned for this Friday, I believe, with uh, Dmitry Lazarus. Perhaps he can speak out about that. Thank you. I believe, um, I'll go, go ahead real quickly, it's it's 7.10, so I do want to end, but go ahead real quickly if you want, uh, Ken, to mention that. I don't Not, think he's, he's listening. Oh, there it goes. Go ahead. Anyways, I'll, maybe I'll just, I'll leave it there, but, but yes, it, there is a webinar on the 18th that the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War is organizing with Dimitri, who is going to, I don't know all the details, but I believe is going to Russia. Um, so I don't know if, the, if that's been put in the chat, but people can get the information on the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the Wars, uh, if you're on their email or on their uh, website, and I believe it's on uh, March 18th, which I believe is the Saturday. Okay, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for uh, a nice session. Uh, same time, same place uh, next week. Take care.